Hello everyone, uh, in this lecture we will discuss about the historical foundations of usability. It is important for us to know the historical antecedents of this discipline, because then it will help us to understand how the entire movement of usability engineering or the concept of usability started. Uh, though it has some bloody history in terms of uh, when uh, uh, it was first conceived or the idea started during world wars, but then later as the movement towards uh, graphical user interface uh, started, um, it became more prominent and uh, researchers, scientists, designers uh, started working in these phenomena in a much more uh, extensive way. So, we will all discuss uh, about all these topics uh, in this lecture. So, let us begin. Uh, the concept of usability is a product of millions of designers trying for decades to describe what they are doing to make technology easier and pleasant. Now, this is very important to understand. The advent of industrial revolution, the advent of uh, uh, human civilization, having access to machines uh, started this concept of how can we make machines more effective and efficient, so that human drudgery, human effort is reduced and the machines become pervasive, so that without a, a major effort. Um, the activities and the tasks can be achieved with ease, you know. And that is what uh, you would see and realize when we talk about the historical foundations of usability. Uh, Vitruvius uh, was the first person, uh, if we can trace back in history, who actually uh, laid the foundations of systemic, systematic and elaborated principles of design. Now, Marcus Vitruvius Polio is a Roman architect. He was a civil and military engineer, who uh, around in the first century BC, uh, explained or defined the three core design principles. And these were uh, Fermitas, Utilitas, and Vinastas. Now, by Fermitas, he meant the strength and durability of the design. Uh, by Utilitas, he meant a design's usefulness and suitability for the needs of its intended users. And third, Vinastas, he meant about the beauty of the design. From Vitruvius, if you see, you can now in the literature or in the history, history you can now uh, see that uh, his philosophies has a direct relationship to the work done by uh, Vinci, Leonardo da Vinci, an Italian engineer, uh, scientist, painter, uh, sculptor, uh, architect, what not. He he can be classified as a as a human being who excelled in every every spheres of uh, discipline and knowledge. And uh, the the essence of uh, Vitruvius uh, theories and philosophies can be can be found in the work of uh, uh, Leonardo da Vinci's the well known Vitruvian man. And what he did is he empirically measured the uh, proportions of human body and then created the image that you see in this slide, uh, which is known as the Vitruvian man. So, here what you would see is uh, uh, the, the emphasis of the principle of utilitas uh, 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 professed by uh, Vitruvius around uh, first century BC. Later, as we move ahead, uh, we can figure out that the uh, 
uh, early traces of usability can be figured out when World War I started and, and it extended to World War II. Uh, many of the methods that we know and use today have their roots in uh, the, the concept of ergonomics and human factors. And uh, you, all these phenomena started uh, during World War I when military personnel uh, were focusing on what design do they need to kill more enemies through better matching soldier and weapon and thus avoiding getting killed. So, that was the essence of uh, the world wars which made uh, the discipline of usability uh, initially started as human factors and ergonomics uh, as being widely accepted by military and engineers and scientists. Now, uh, in both the phases, in both the World War I's, one World War I and World War II, uh, the, uh, the, the research conducted by the military engineers and scientists involved in machinery design uh, fueled extensive work in the field of human factors early early human factors and uh, uh, during those times the military designers uh, defined uh, the formative matrix of usability and these are uh, how quickly will a crew will a new crew member learn how to use the artillery cannon now this was important because there was a lot of uh, casualties during those period and it was utmost important for a new crew member to get himself accustomed with the uh, machines, with the war machines and therefore, it is very important that uh, the, the uh, crew members could adopt to this machinery as fast as possible. Second, how many rounds per minute uh, is the cannon able to fire with an inexperienced versus an experienced uh, crew. Now, here what you would see that uh, the first uh, uh, the first philosophies of a comparative uh, evaluation between uh, user characteristics which are the military personnels here started developing. Uh, the focus was essentially on uh, people who were experienced or crew members who were experienced in handling uh, these military arsenals or machines versus uh, the novice or the new uh, or the first time uh, military personnels who started uh, using these equipments. Now, uh, understanding both the characteristics of a novice uh, crew member and an expert crew member becomes then very important that is what uh, the, the military engineers realized during those periods and they wanted to identify this in terms of the task completion and in this context task completion became what became the rounds of fire the cannon can make right and that was compared between an expert a crew member versus a novice crew member. Third, they were uh, focused on how will the design improve, the design of the cannon improve uh, target acquisition. So, here you would realize that the formative concepts of effectiveness uh, started emerging, you know. Uh, finally, any war machine is evaluated based on the goal that it achieves. In this case, the goal of the cannon is to kill uh, or make a devastating effect onto the target. So, the military engineers uh, focused on how uh, the, the accuracy of the target can be improved. And finally, how does a design improvement decrease soldier fatigue. So, drudgery, uh, the, the effort 
that was uh, to be made by the soldiers, the crew members became of paramount interest, because that has an effect on the efficiency of the crew members in using those machines. Now, here what we see that the, for the first time the philosophies of cog cognitive load that means mental processes started emerging. So, these are very, very cruel and uh, um, bloody moments in the history, but then all these uh, moments uh, provided uh, the foundational um, uh, uh, philosophies of usability and human factors uh, being conceived. Now, uh, during uh, in the late uh, later stage of the world was World War One in 1916, uh, Frank Gilbert and Lillian Moller uh, decomposed a uh, work. They uh, cut down uh, work into smaller steps, and they become pioneers in making work quicker and easier. Now. Frank Bunker Gilbert was an American engineer and his wife uh, Lillian Moller Gilbert were known as industrial engineers and they were experts in uh, efficiency uh, philosophies in defining, um, um, defining the concept of efficiency, uh, working out in tasks, defining uh, tasks flows to identify and, and optimize uh, efficiency concepts. Now, they were the first person who ensured that um, these kind of investigations were carried out to identify how a particular task can be broken down, can be decomposed and uh, uh, aspects of how efficiency can be improved can be studied. Now, they applied this method during World War I. And this helped uh, the soldiers, the crew members uh, in, in the assembly or the disassembly of the weapons of their uh, cannons. Um, and that is how the early concepts of efficiency started. Later on, uh, one of the famous uh, movement happened started in 1919 in Germany and that was started by uh, Walter Gropius, a German architect. And Walter Gropius uh, founds the Bauhaus, Bauhaus is the first school of industrial design in, in Bauhaus, um, founds the Bauhaus uh, school of design. Now, this school laid the foundation for the professions of graphic and industrial design. And, and um, those who are aware of uh, Bauhaus and uh, design philosophy, uh, you would realize that uh, his famous maxim or statement or philosophy, uh, form follows fun function, uh, was uh, uh, professed during that period of time, which even now we follow. And this uh, has laid the first foundational aspects of uh, usability based design, form follows function. Uh, so, Walter Gropius and his contribution in uh, the history of design uh, played a very significant role uh, in the design uh, history and the design movement in India as well. Uh, we have uh, uh, many design schools and design um, um, movements um, in India uh, that was inspired from uh, Bahos and the Ulm school of design lately. Now, in 1943, Alphonse Chapnis, a lieutenant of the US Army, uh, who would later uh, be, would be considered as the father of ergonomics and human factors discipline. He for the first time demonstrated that 
uh, pilot error can be greatly reduced uh, with the most intuitive arrangement of the airplane controls. Right? That is a significant uh, study and uh, uh, investigation that happened during those period of time. And these ensured that the concept of human factor, that the philosophy of human factors ergonomics uh, was laid uh, while product design uh, was uh, carried out extensively during those periods. Lately, uh, in 1954, uh, Fitts law uh, was uh, proposed by none other than Paul Fitts and um, this laid down the fundamentals of user interface and physical product design. This was followed by 1969, when um, Xerox uh, started the GUI revolution and created the Xerox Spark machine. They invented the first mouse, uh, object oriented programming and uh, was the first group or the organization who started the concept of user interface. Later in 1984, uh, Steve Jobs introduced the Mac and he uh, for the first time uh, established the design guidelines on user interface design. This was uh, followed by uh, in 1986 when John uh, Brook uh, for the first time uh, provided all design practitioners and usability practitioners with the system usability skill. That was a great movement. Uh, or, or great anecdote rather uh, for the movement of usability, because now we have a scale, we have an instrument through which uh, we can get feedback, we can measure uh, the, the experiential part the, of, of our actual users and uh, this uh, paved a, a, a extensive uh, revolution uh, in the lines of uh, designing uh, usable systems. And uh, this was followed by in 1987 by Ben Snedeman's The Eight Golden Rules of Interface Design. Now, if you see the historical foundations of uh, uh, late 1980s, you would realize that uh, the, the prices in the late 1980s, the prices of computers started falling. And for the first time, it, it, it was made feasible for many employees to have their own personal computer. That was something uh, very significant, because until then the, the computers that were designed and invented was used in organizations in closed groups across research groups, who were highly trained and expert in using those computers. But it changed in late 90s, uh, 1980s when the prices started falling and um, employees in organization started owning computers or started accessing these computers. And then we, uh, we see the era of personal computing happening. Now, most computer users had practically no or only basic training on operating systems and application software. But uh, software design practices assumed their tasks, their users as knowledgeable and competent. That was the issue um, that majority of the computer users faced, that the softwares, the operating systems were designed keeping in mind people who are trained who are experts and who can only use these after an ex extensive uh, training. These operating systems and softwares were not uh, uh, being designed keeping in mind the first time users or the early adopters of these technologies. And uh, therefore, what happens? What happened? Majority of the early adopters, they faced issues with technical vocabularies because they were not aware of system architectures 
and therefore, they, they lacked aptitude for solving problems arising from computer usage. These were the early issues uh, that happened. Now, for any average user, uh, a interactive computing became associated with constant frustrations and consequent anxieties. And the, the foremost reason being, it was not decided keeping designed keeping in mind the characteristics of the novice people who would adopt these personal computers and start using it. They were designed keeping in mind the expert and trained actual users. Now, computers were obviously too hard to use for most of the users and often uh, what happened they turned out to be impractical. You know people could not use it. Those who bought them, who started using them, they failed in, in, in adopting those computers and using it. So, usability became a key goal for the design of any interactive software that would not be used by trained technical computer specialist. That is how uh, the, the concept of usability started. It started with uh, focusing on the early adopters of computers, on those users who lacked technical expertise, who did not have an iota of understanding about system architecture, who did not have or, or lacked aptitude to, to solve uh, critical errors um, arising of, out of computer usage. It is during that time that usability of these systems became essential, so that early adoption can happen. Early adoption of these systems among the novice actual users happen and uh, the, the life of these people can become easy, less uh, uh, drudgery and uh, effortless uh, in order to, to help them uh, reach their goal. All these happenings um, across uh, 1980s and early 1990s made sure that designers focus on usability as a, a major, major uh, area uh, of uh, uh, focus for design of interactive systems. Now, while all these were happening, if you go back and take a look at the literatures, you would realize that uh, designing such interactive systems focused among the design community, specifically based on two approaches. The first one was the essentialist approach, the second one which was considered as the contextual approach. Now, in the essentialist approach, it is considered that usability is a feature of an interactive system. Like, you know, you see a website and uh, any designer or any usability expert can uh, make this point that the website is not user friendly, he or she is not able to complete his task uh, by, by accessing or using the web page. A website or a system has poor usability when there is no visibility of the system status, you are not sure as a user at what location, at what stage of your activity you are currently uh, positioned and therefore, you, are no, you have no idea about the status of the, of the system in terms of your activity. Now, this approach considers that all causes of user performance are due to technology in a sense because of the wrong design of the interface or the faulty design of the interface or the faulty design of the uh, back end technologies. The second approach which is the contextual approach, it considers usability as a feature of interaction between user, computer and the context. Now, this is very important that uh, we can 
This is very important here to understand that for the first time the concept of context is introduced. If you see here, the concept of context is introduced. Right? Now, therefore, this approach became contextual approach. The reason being the focus of the user and the computer that is being used is on the context. The focus is on the context. The designers, the usability practitioners focused on the context. This approach considers issues related to user performance to have different causalities. That means, instead of only saying that uh, this issue exists because of the technology or the design, it considers that the different uh, reasons of usability issues can be related uh, probably to technologies or to usage context or it can be attributed to the interactions between technologies and the usage context. So, here for the first time you would realize the apart from the, the focus on technology, the focus also shifts on how the product is being used. So, the user comes into the foray, the way he uses the system, the way he things while he is using the system, the surrounding situations that governs his or influences his mind or his mental model to take a decision while using the system. All these parameters became of utmost interest and therefore, the second important approach becomes critical for us to understand because in this approach, it is important that we realize at what circumstances, at what situation, at what context ideally our actual users are going to use the system, how and in under what circumstances they are going to use the product, the software, the web page the interface. Right? These were the early, early uh, approaches which also extends to now. Many, many of our techniques tools can be divided across this uh, early, I mean this kind of approaches of usability evolution. Now, adopting these approaches requires using tools and techniques for conducting the evaluation. And the major types of uh, the two important uh, types of uh, evaluation methods that our uh, literature suggests that have been used by early adopters of usability uh, discipline were uh, the analytical and the empirical evaluation methods. Now, analytical evaluation methods are based on examination of an interactive system you know, or the dialogue, the potential interactions that the system has with its user. Now, you can analyze the system or the interaction with the system. That is what is the focus for the analytical evaluation methods. In the empirical evaluation methods, the focus is on the usage data, how the system is being used, those data and those data are analyzed and then decisions regarding whether we have a good usability or we have a bad usability is being arrived. Analytical evaluation methods were further divided into three major types. These are 
the inspection methods, the system centered in its inspection methods and the interaction centered methods. Now, the inspection methods tend to focus on the causes of good or poor usability. Right? The system centered inspection methods focuses on software and hardware features regarding attributes that promote or obstruct usability. While the interaction centered methods focus on two or more causal factors, software features, user characteristics, task demands or other contextual factors. Now, what you see here is the difference across these three techniques that are essentially known as the analytical evaluation methods. In cases of inspection methods, which are often conducted by usability practitioners or uh, designers, they inspect the interface, they inspect a software product and the focus is on to identify uh, good or poor usability issues based on principles of usability or heuristics of usability. In the second approach, what you see is uh, the focus which is more towards the software as well as the hardware features. So, integration of both what you see as an interface and what happens behind it, both these features and the attributes are considered while identifying the issues that support or that are detrimental to the idea of usability. In a third evaluation method, the focus is more on the causal factors. What are the causes behind the usability issues? Is it related to software feature? Is it related to the user characteristics? So, here more than as a characteristic of the product, the focus is more on the defining issues of the users, their characteristics, their personality traits, their task demands and other contextual factors like environmental issues, the, the factors that influence your users to take a decision. These are considered as the three analytical evaluation methods. In empirical evaluation methods, the focus is on evidence of good or poor usability. So, user testing, right? User testing is the principal project focused method. You have an interface, you have a product, you have a software design, go to the user and test it out. They will let you know about good or poor usability. They will not tell you about good or poor usability, their actions will help you to interpret good and poor usability of the product. It uses project specific resources such as test tasks, users and also measuring instruments to expose usability problems that can arise in use. If you remember the advent of system usability scale by John Broke in 1986, this these are the instruments that we are referring to. These scales uh, many valid, reliable and uh, good quality uh, scales have are being referred by usability practitioners as measuring instruments to identify and extract the usability issues and problems that arises because of use of those products in the context of the user. Now, all these, all these are the issues, the philosophies and the approaches that can be traced back in the calendars, in the formative years 
of when human factors started and usability as a discipline grew. It is evident from here that what started as uh, the early adoption or of usability in terms of how war machines can be designed later with the advent of uh, graphical user interface became uh, usability that we use more so often now and the focus though remains same, but the approach of working towards a usable system changed. It, it, it is not only about effectiveness of efficiency, it is about experience. That is what has changed over the years. It is just not sufficient for your software, your web page to have an effective design, so that your users can reach or complete their task in the most effective way without errors, with higher accuracy, with high efficiency. But it is also important that your users can achieve this goal, can complete this goal with a high degree of satisfaction. It is also important that you design your system in a way that you take into consideration the user characteristics, so that your interface can cater to the variable needs of a novice user, of an intermediate user, of an expert user. Why this is important? This is important because each of these categories of user shall have variable demands, shall have variable re requirements and therefore, it is important as an usability practitioner that you consider these important issues while you conceive a design intervention for them. These important facets from history, the foundations of usability from the history provides us with an idea about how the formative year started, how it got evolved and where we are standing now. The different paradigms that can be observed across these historical foundations or the historical uh, period will allow us to understand how the concept or the philosophy of usability has changed over the period of time and where it is moving. In the next lecture, we will now take up on the different termo uh, terminologies that are uh, adopted across uh, organizations like ISO and uh, how that uh, definitions uh, allow us to see usability and its uh, characteristics and its parameters and governs the uh, future use of uh, principles uh, related to usability uh, when we start designing for systems. We will delve deep into those uh, concepts and discuss about them. Thank you.